Well, welcome to Israel's Hope Bible Church Online. My name is Ron Grossman, and this is our final installment in 2 Peter chapter 3 as we finish uh, our studies in this book today. And we're just happy that you're here with us. Um, I'm wearing a particular T-shirt today. If you can see any of it or part of it, it's uh, my Rapture Ready T-shirt. And we have to go on to new studies in the coming weeks. And I'm wearing this shirt and um, just as a reminder that um, in the next few weeks, we're going to be doing some studies in um, uh, topics in basic Bible prophecy, looking at things that have to do with Israel today and the scriptures and future things. And so we're hoping that you'll join us in the coming weeks regarding these things. Uh, we're going to look at Second Peter chapter 3, the last few verses, verses 13 through 18 to be exact. And before we get to that, let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to direct us in what we do here today. Father God, thank you for each person who's looking in live or perhaps looking in later on. Whatever it is, Lord, we ask that you would use our time here to give glory and honor to you. Thank you for eternal life that you give only through your son, Jesus, and what that means to us. Use the rest of this time to glorify you and what we teach that it is literally from your word, not from us, but it is of your word only. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Follow with me, please, as we read verses 13 through 18. It says this, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent, that you may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless, and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. As also in all of his epistles, speaking in them of things in which are some things hard to understand, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware lest you also, being led away with the air of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. These are words of encouragement and challenge to us. And we're closing the title of this message in uh, our finishing of these studies is Closing with Encouragement. It's, you know, easy to only want to see what you want to see. And sometimes it is easy for the enemy of God to make you see only what he wants you to see. Error, discouragement, all of those things. Now, when there are things wrong, we have a responsibility to point out error, but not to the point of discouragement. We should point out error with the hopes that someone will be reconciled in the right way to God. You see, God has called us to a greater hope than to constantly only see the things of the enemy. And as we close our studies here in 2 Peter, we need to remember two things. And I'm going to remember, remind you of these things to remember as we go through today. Stay in the word as you stand for truth. Stay in the word as you stand for truth. And let's take a look at what these verses have to say to us that help us to understand this. Now, we're looking at verse 13 again, and it's overlapping from our studies last time. It's overlapping because we need to connect and finally make the connection of everything we've been looking at in all of these chapters here. We stand on promises that God has made to us, and God keeps his promise. Look at verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. There is a new heaven and a new earth coming one day. And when that new earth and new heaven comes, it will be a righteous place. Now, when we come back with the Lord after the events of the book of Revelation in chapter 19, verse 20, and starting into chapter 20 of Revelation, not verse 20, but going into chapter 20 of Revelation, we're going to come back with him. Jesus will put down that horrid events, uh, the horrid events of the book of Revelation and the final of Armageddon. And then we're going to rule with them here for a thousand years. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are going to rule with him here 
on this planet for 1,000 years. Now think about that. 1,000 years you will rule with him here. God has made promises to us and specifically his son Jesus made promises to us about his coming for us. Now I want to take us to John chapter 14 for a moment. If you can turn there in John chapter 14 in the first four verses as Jesus is preparing to go to the cross to offer up his life for all of mankind. He's making a promise to his disciples here. And this same promise is applicable to you and me. Look what it says in verse 1 of John chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. So what he's saying here is, I am God. He said the same thing in John chapter 8 verse 58. He said, before Abraham was, I am. And the I am in the Hebrew scriptures, as per Exodus chapter 3, is the self-existing one. So Jesus was saying he is the self-existing one, John 8, 58. He, uh, they asked him again in John chapter 10, if you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. And he said to them there, I've told you, you don't believe. I told you in John chapter 8, verse 58. Now he's telling his disciples, you believe in God, believe also in me. And he's saying, I am God. Now look what he says. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. So he's going to go ahead of us and he is preparing a place for us to be with him and we will be with him forever. And if I go and prepare a place for you, now here's the great promise. I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. And whether I go, you know, and the way you know. Now they asked him, well, where are you going and how do we get there and everything else? But Jesus said, you know. If you have a relationship with God, you know who he is. The, the ancient Hebrews, they knew that God had a promise of an eternal place for all who would call on him. And they looked for that promise in faith with hope. You want to read about some of those Old Testament saints, as we refer to them as? Read through Hebrews chapter 11. I had a teacher in school who called it for us the biblical hall of faith. You like sports? I do. Baseball, particularly. I've been to the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York, and I've seen those are enshrined in the hall and their plaques and the other things that, that contribute to all of that. But there's no earthly hall of faith. It is one that is going to be when you are with him forever. He is going to take us to be with him forever. And eventually, after that 1,000 years, there will be new heavens and a new earth. But it will come in stages. So, if you know this promise, stand on them. God keeps his promises. And the greatest promise for the church is, I'm coming for you. John chapter 14, verses 1 to 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. The rapture of the church, the supernatural taking up of believers to be with him. Now, Jesus did die, didn't he? But here are the promises of what he said would happen to him and what would happen afterwards that would give him eternity, give him eternal, to give to you eternal life, excuse me. Jesus did die, but he did resurrect. He did ascend to heaven. And he is coming back for us. There is no greater promise than this. He's coming back. And there will be a new heaven and a new earth, as verse 13 of Second Peter 3 says. When he's coming back, it'll be to give us eternal righteousness. Think about this for a moment. Eternal righteousness. You will have eternal righteousness. So if you know that, look what he says in verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you be, be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. If you're eagerly waiting for him and for this, you need to lead and live expectant lives. Now, I mentioned last time as we finished, headed towards finishing these studies about the doctrine of imminency. Jesus can come at any time, 
there is no scripture that says that it, look for this event and that means Jesus is coming. It is not going to happen like this. But you want to be found in peace, without spot, in other words, without sin and blameless. You know, if you're a follower of Jesus, you need to know that God forgives you even of sin that you commit as a believer. And if you say you have no sin in you, well, I would suggest you read 1 John chapter 1, verses 3 through 10. Because it's a very sobering passage that speaks to the fact that followers of Jesus, if they have sin, this is what you need to do. Go to him, confess it. And then what he, John says to us in that passage, 1 John chapter 1, verses 3 through 10, is that God is just, righteous, and holy, and forgives you. That's hope. That is the hope that you have as a follower of Jesus. That is the hope you can have if you turn to him as your Messiah. So if you're waiting for this, you need to live expectant lives. You need to live a life that is looking for Jesus to come for us. Now in verse 15, he goes on and says this, Peter does, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the, his, the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. The word here, account, literally means consider the long suffering of the Lord. The word account means consider. Consider what God has done. First off, God created the heavens and the earth. God gave you life. God has given you everything that you have. God has given you eternal life through his son, Jesus. The long suffering of God is that even while we were yet sinners, Christ did come, the Messiah did come, he did die, he willingly went to die in your place. He had every reason to judge the world before this. He did judge the world in the flood, as you read about in Genesis 6 through 9. But he's not judging the world anymore like that. He said he'll never do that again. He's given us that sign in the sky, which is the rainbow, that he would never again judge the world by flooding. But it is God's desire that as many as possible would come to salvation. And it's not that he's delaying coming, it's that his time frame is not what we consider to be the time frame. God will act in his manner, in his way, in his time. He's not constrained by time. God has always been and always will be the great I am, the self-existing one. But he is holding back and judging the world even now at this moment as you may listen to this. There's coming a time where God is going to judge this world. First, the church will be removed, 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18. And then as in chronological order, I've mentioned this again in recent weeks, after that comes the day of the Lord, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 through 11. He now is saying to us, consider that God is being gracious. You know, one of the greatest promises you can find in the scripture if you're a follower of Jesus is that you've been saved by no merit of your own. It is by God's unmerited favor shown to you. That's what grace means. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 was taught to me many years ago when I first turned to, to being a follower of Jesus as Messiah. For by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works, lest any man boast. Grace is what you don't deserve, but you get it anyways. The free gift of eternal life. Romans 3 verse 23 says, all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. But then three chapters later, almost to the verse, if you can say it like that, in Romans 6 23 says this, the wages of sin is death. The payment for sin is what that means. You earn a salary, it's your wage. You have earned, I have earned death. Why? Because we have all inherited the sin nature of Adam and Eve. And it is not hard for any of us to sin. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus. It's a free gift. It's given to you by grace. God has given you a free gift of eternal life. 
How do you get it? You simply come to the realization that Jesus is God, who willingly came to die on that cross to pay the penalty for your sin. And he doesn't care what nation group you come from. He doesn't care where you, uh, where you work, where you live, how wealthy you are, or anything like that. He only cares about whether you're going to turn to him for eternal life. He doesn't care if you're Jewish, like I am, or a Gentile, like anyone else, perhaps. He wants any and all people of the house of Israel and all other nations to come to him and say, I want that gift of eternal life. I don't deserve it. I recognize that. I recognize that Jesus is God. And I recognize that the most amazing thing that God ever did, as I've so often play, uh, said it to you in these messages, is that God took on human form and willingly went to die in your place. He paid the penalty for your sin. God became a human like us and allowed himself to be ignominiously executed in your place as the payment for your sin. Now he turns his attention to the Apostle Paul in verse, the latter part of verse 15. And he talks about the words of wisdom given by Paul and written to you. So Paul has written to these believers as well. Now, as he goes on here, there's a couple of interesting points. One point by one particular Bible scholar that I accounted to was Ed Heinsen, Dr. Ed Heinsen at Liberty University. He points out here that if Peter is speaking about the Apostle Paul in a positive sense about what Paul teaches through his writings, that it is pretty obvious that the rift that had existed between the two of them, which you can read about in Galatians chapter 2 verse 14, had obviously been healed. Believers will have rifts, will have disagreements with other believers. But it's incumbent on us as believers, as much as lies within you, be at peace with all men, as Paul, uh, the apostle, told the church in Rome in the book of Romans. Be at peace with all men, as much as lies within you. You do the best you possibly can. Now, if there's a division between you and another believer. If you have made every effort to try and make things right and that hasn't been returned, you've made the effort. Leave it with the Lord. He'll take care of it see what God can do? Peter had gone off into the what they call the Judaizers of that time. Today we call it Messianic Judaism. The people who come and, and literally prey upon Jewish believers and say to them, you, you haven't got it all right. Uh, you need to not only be a believer in the Messiah, and uh, by the way, call him Yeshua HaMashiach. Don't call him Jesus. That's the Gentiles call him. Um, and you need to come to worship on a Friday and Saturday. And you need to wear a talit, a, a prayer shawl, a, a yarmulke, a head covering. And you need to keep the Sabbath and the kosher laws and all these things. And this is what Paul took Peter to task for in Galatians chapter 2. And Peter eventually realized the Apostle Paul was right. And the differences between them were healed, obviously, that Peter here in this verse says that listen to the writings of Paul. Listen to what he has to say. And look what he says here um, in verse, um, the latter part of verse 16. And he speaks here about uh, all his epistles, speaking of them, of these things, in which are some things hard to understand. Well, some things are hard to understand if you're a new believer in Jesus. So what do you do? You do what Paul told Timothy. Study to show thyself approved, a worker who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The only way you'll be able to learn the things of God and from his word is studying in them. It, you can't get it by going to church on Sunday, hearing a message, maybe taking two or three notes, attending a men's group or a ladies group once a week, and then you're just on your merry way. It's the time that you put in on your own own as well that is required. I was told when I graduated from uh, Bible school the first time and in the subsequent studies I've had, if you think that you've learned everything now, you haven't yet. Keep on learning. And that is our responsibility. Paul is referring here, I believe, also to those false teachers earlier on in this letter where he took them to task over and over for their false teaching. 
the unla the unlearned he refers to them here look at the latter part of verse 16 they are the unlearned the unstable and they rest as they do also other scriptures to their own destruction they take the word and they twist it and they make it say what it doesn't say and then he goes on in verse 17 and he says this you have been taught different you therefore seeing you know these things before beware lest also you being led away with the hour of the wicked fall from your own steadfast fastness stay in the word that is the greatest admonition i have always been given and i give to you as well study it stay in it do it on a daily basis you have a requirement as a follower of jesus to do that not because you're compelled to because it's legal that you have to do it you have a requirement in order to be able to grow in the Lord. Do you want to grow in the Lord? Or do you want to remain the same as you were when you first became a follower of Jesus? You see, you need to grow. Look at verse 18. And this is where we conclude. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I've already mentioned grace. It's unmerited favor. The more you study his word is the more you realize what God's unmerited favor towards you is. You realize how little you deserve of it. You realize how gracious and loving God is that he has done all this for you. And because you grow in this unmerited favor you've been given, it's all summarized as I've already said in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, not, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works lest any man boast. There is not one work you can do to make yourself better before God. He has done it for you. So grow in grace and in knowledge. Study the word, as Paul told Timothy, study the word. And you know what happens in the end of all of that? God gets all the glory. And that's how Peter closes this letter. He says, to him be glory both now and forever. That forever is the most important thing that you can take from all of this. Because you're going to spend eternity in one place or another. Where do you want to spend eternity? If you want to spend eternity with God, you have to do what I said earlier. Recognize you're a sinner. Recognize that the only way to God is by accepting the fact that his son, Jesus, came at the right time in history. Born of the right tribe of the house of Israel. Had every right to the throne of David and allowed himself as prophesied to be taken to that roman cross to die in your place do you want to spend eternity with god or separated from god i heard a missionary years ago say to us at the end of a missions conference every person who has ever lived is going to live forever where do you want to spend forever with god or separated from god if you need to make a decision about that or have questions about that feel free to be in contact with us. The contact information you can see at the bottom of the screen and our web page information is there as well. Let me also close by reminding you of the fact that we are a faith ministry. We trust God's people to help um, see to our ministry going forward. We're in the summer months. Giving is a little bit down. There is a bit of an emergency right now. So would you pray that the Lord through his people might provide? And if you have um, a sense that God is calling you to perhaps contribute to that. Consider the contact information as per the screen. You can give through our website, through PayPal, a transfer, e-transfers online, or the old-fashioned way of putting a check in the mail. And our mailing address shows there at Box 47031 Blackburn Post Office, Ottawa, Ontario, K1B5P9. We'll be back next week. And we'll be looking at some general themes in Bible prophecy. It's going to kind of be our segue into our Bible prophecy conferences, which will be held in various locations uh, in Atlantic and Central Canada uh, this coming autumn. Specifically, um, there will be there are two dates already scheduled: October 24th in Montreal. Usually, we hold those meetings at Onward Gospel Church, where we will be again this year, and that's on a Thursday night. Um, contact us here at uh, the I Hope office at the email that shows below. And the Ottawa Bible Prophecy Conference will be held on October 26th, Saturday. It's usually starting at 12.30 p.m. in the afternoon and continues through to 5 p.m. Uh, that day. Or my guest speaker this year will be Pastor Mike Ferreira of Marku Road Bible Church 
in uh, near Alexandria, Ontario, and I look forward to seeing Mike again and working with him on these conferences. It's a pleasure to serve the Lord through this medium. Thank you for being with us today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Shalom.